That's the advert over. I'd now like to uh, hand over to Warren, who's going to say a few words as well. Warren has uh, joined Cambridge Clean Tech through Retrofit Works as our latest associate founder member. And he's also uh, co-chairing this special interest group um, along with Peter Bates. So Warren uh, is going to see us through the, uh, the line of the day and Peter's uh, in, in charge of the questions. So Warren, delighted to uh, hand over to you and a warm welcome to you as well. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today's session is, as you will know, is about indoor air quality. Um, with particular thoughts to uh, has has been commented in the last week, depending on where you live, if you open the window to let some fresh air in, that fresh air is not necessarily as fresh as you might think it is. Hence the importance of ensuring that we can actually get uh, clean air inside the home. Um, at the moment, we're looking to decarbonise approximately 29 million UK homes. Um, we are the special interest group uh, for a smart homes, which is looking to see what can be done to make uh, living uh, that's more, that much more uh, suitable and sustainable for us all and as healthy as possible. Um, the role played by the indoor air quality uh, will also help uh, reduce the spread of disease. Uh, in particular with the light of the pandemic uh, coming through and then we've yet to have flu and other areas to come through. Improving the air quality inside the home can help increase the healthiness of everything. Um, as we um, move forward, there are a number of options in order to, to suit what can be done for an individual or non-domestic property, or sorry, domestic property, I should say, if I get my right hat on. Um, and hopefully some of the solutions that we'll see today from the speakers will be of interest to people and will help people to move on and ensure that they have suitable um, clean air within inside the home. So without any further ado, uh, I shall pass on, pass on to um, Alan Pitha, the uh, CEO of Energy Consulting and Training, uh, to start the talk. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Good. Okay, let me put the presentation on if I can navigate around the screen successfully. Um, just need to find the screen share button. And uh, here we go. So, um, slideshow, current slide. So, I've been asked to give a, a briefing on PAS 2035 and uh, in particular with respect to ventilation. And um, uh, so I'm gonna do a little bit of an introduction on why PAS 2035 is needed, why it's been brought in, and then gonna just run through the ventilation requirements. It's, PAS 2035 covers a lot more than that, but obviously today's uh, topic is ventilation. So I'm gonna focus in on, on, on those details in particular. So that's what I'm aiming to do in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, so PAS 2035 is a British standard that has been developed to uh, improve the quality of retrofit projects in, in the UK, domestic in particular. There is a parallel PAS 2038 that covers non-domestic buildings with similar, similar objectives. Um, but the, the key aim is to uh, bring in uh, much better quality retrofits. There's been a history of, of problems with retrofit projects uh, in particular, unintended consequences, often including dampness, um, poor air quality, sufficient um, insulation, not getting the full benefits that you would expect from the insulation measures. Uh, and, and PAS 2035 brings in a number of things such as um, new roles to bring professional accountability into the different aspects of projects. It brings in the whole house approach, um, but enabling bespoking of projects to the individual properties. And it brings in the key principles that many of us have, have worked uh, to uh, over many years, build tight, ventilate right, and fabric first. So that's the overall, the overall objectives. And the aim is to manage the risks. We can't eliminate all the risks, but hopefully we can manage them to an acceptable level. And that includes technical risks, so things like getting the right improvements uh, designed, uh, managing the interactions between different measures, 
uh, considering ventilation and air quality, which in the past has been neglected. And as I've already said, avoiding unintended consequences. So uh, there's also process risks, getting the procedures uh, in place that will ensure quality job. So uh, at the initial stages, getting the assessments right, uh, then ensuring that we've got appropriate designs, uh, that thought has gone into how the measures all with the right qualifications and skills uh, involved. In terms of ventilation, as I say, the, the uh, ventilation has often been a neglected aspect of uh, insulation and energy improvements in the past. Um, but um, we need to remember that ventilation is important. Uh, two key reasons, we need to remove stale polluted air and we need to supply fresh, fresh air from the outside. Um, both are needed, obviously, and both will happen in, in parallel. Um, and in the past, we've relied very much on accidental ventilation or uncontrolled ventilation, much of which comes through gaps and cracks in the building fabric, and um, at the same time leads to excessive heat loss uh, and drafts that reduce thermal comfort in the property. And also without ventilation, buildings deteriorate as well. So we can get uh, moisture problems uh, in, within the structure, we can get uh, condensation and mould on the surfaces within the property, and we can also get pollutants uh, building up, um, and that affects people's health as well as the condition of the building. So um, the key principle is that we should have no insulation without ventilation. Um, we need to think about where we're going to get the deliberate ventilation we need uh, to replace the infiltration that will never be lost when we, when we add insulation. And as a general principle, uh, continuous mechanical ventilation, such as MEV, mechanical extract ventilation that runs continuously, is going to be more effective than intermittent fans, which is what most of us still rely on. And of course, if we can build in heat recovery, um, either, um, well, primarily with uh, MVHR, mechanical ventilation with heat recovery systems, uh, that will also help to save energy um, reduce the heat loss associated with the ventilation. And building tight is important um, so that we've got, the, we can then, uh, if we've got a reasonably airtight building, we can then install the appropriate amount of ventilation that we need. Uh, and that's been, as I say, a, a guiding principle for many years. And, and PAS 2035 is picking up on that. Um, so we want to, we want controlled extract and supply. Um, and uh, we want to uh, make sure that um, in that way we've got the ventilation we need. So PAS 2035 has a number of detailed requirements. Um, they appear in Annex C if you're familiar with the document uh, or if you, if you look in the document and the um, key thing to bear in mind is that some of the requirements do go beyond those in approved document F, especially the current one. There is a, there is an update to uh, approved document F that's going to be implemented from June, um, but I think it's probably fair to say that the past 2035 requirements are, are still higher um, as things stand. And yeah, the key requirement is that whenever there's any insulation or air tightness measure installed, which could include replacing windows, um, the ventilation should be assessed and if necessary improved. And um, other examples of, what, of, of when this would apply would be replacing open flue to plant is with room sealed ones or sealing up chimneys and flues. So that's in, a, in addition or instead of any, any insulation measures. So in association with the uh, property assessment, the whole dwelling assessment that PAS 2035 requires, there's a ventilation assessment. And there's four key aspects of that. Um, four questions if you like and if it's yes to any of those then the ventilation is deemed inadequate. So that's whether there's any evidence of condensation or mould, if there's no ventilation system or no or the ventilation system's not functioning, if there's no undercuts beneath the internal doors so the air can move through the dwelling or if there's no purge ventilation which is a um, similar requirement to approved document F. So Purge ventilation is in particular to um, 
minimize the risk of summer overheating following insulation. So it's another aspect that's linked. There's a range of uh, acceptable ventilation systems defined in PAS 2035. They include IEV, intermittent extract ventilation, so that's conventional fans, uh, passive stack ventilation that doesn't rely on fans at all, positive input ventilation, which pressurizes the dwelling and assumes that uh, air can get out through back background ventilators, or MEV, continuously running extract, extract ventilation. And all of those need background ventilators associated with them um, to balance the, the air pressures to allow generally air out, uh, sorry, generally air in, but in the case of PIV, to, to allow it out. And then the other, um, the other option is mechanical ventilation with heat recovery as a whole house system. And there's also um, uh, advice that if you've got um, a relatively low air permeability, uh, below five, uh, then um, you're probably, you're going to need a continuously operating system. And if there's any, if the ventilation is inadequate, then the uh, retrofit design must include a ventilation upgrade so that it becomes adequate as part of the project. Um, and if uh, there aren't any insulation or air tightness measures, so that it perhaps wouldn't be appropriate to do the ventilation immediately, then the need for that ventilation needs to be included in, in the medium term improvement plan, which is another, number, another of the things that's required by PAS 2035 for, for most projects. So um, uh, in association with ventilation upgrades, there's also a requirement for demand control. So that's ventilation that will respond to uh, either relative humidity or CO2 levels or um, possibly occupancy detection. Um, and there's some guidelines about technical details such as um, ductwork um, connections and there's um, also single room heat recovery ventilation systems can't be used as a, as a whole house system. They can be used to supplement a system where you've got a complex property um, but, um, but not as a whole house system. And then finally there's a whole list of, of technical details, which I am doing with time, but it probably doesn't make sense to, to just read these out to you, but just to, to bear um, 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 criteria here um, that need to be borne in, in mind in terms of design, such as noise levels and uh, need to be uh, energy efficient models uh, and so on and, and qualified people installing them. So that covers what I was planning to say um, and hopefully I haven't overrun my time and I will hand over to Leonard Carey who's the next in line. Thanks Alan. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. Um, it all works. Can you all see my screen? Hopefully there's a few thumbs up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> good. Um, so yeah, so my name is Leonard Carey. I'm the founder of Aware Technologies, um, and we are an Internet of Things business, but also um, AI and, and some um, people science, if you like. And uh, it's all about how do we how do we use data to help people to help themselves um, across a diverse uh, uh, population. <clears throat> The thing that we focus on is this idea of the living performance of homes in use. I think, I think at the moment it's called building performance evaluation in use. Um, but um, we've been working with Leeds City Council, with um, a couple of charities, CSE and Green Doctor. We're also um, working with Civica under a, a GovTech um, uh, sponsored project that's been lasting for about a, a year now. But we're looking at ways of how to improve the, the quality of homes, <clears throat> particularly the air quality and, and how do we um, prevent mold and damp and make it so that people can either find no cost, low cost or assisted help to, uh, to, to improve the environment in their home. <clears throat> but it's all about the strategies really, because what we've discovered is that, um, you know, Leeds have got 55,000 homes um, that they manage on a daily basis. And every home is different. Um, and the, the thing that 
is, is really important to consider is that they're existing stock. And so there is a need to make sure that, you know, you appreciate that every home is different. Um, I think Leeds and some other councils have got some of the oldest property in the UK today. Um, every household is individual, so um, quite a diverse um, ethnic mix within, within Leeds and, and across the UK. But every strategy has got to be personal. It's, it's got to be personal um, based on your health, your income um, and habits. But the one thing that we were asked to do with our technology is how can we find a way of educating people, um, whether it be the tenants, but also the repairs teams and those who provide advice into exactly what is going on in the house um, and work together so that people can then take that education and work together to come up with solutions that work um, for everybody in all their circumstances. <clears throat> so we are um, at the heart of what we do. We are, um, play this video, but, you know, we are, we are scientists, analysts, AI, um, electronic engineers, um, but also product designers. <clears throat> And one thing we had to make sure from the get-go was how are we going to find a way to, to model what's actually going on in a house in 3D? Um, but not just as a snapshot, but as a, as a living environment. <clears throat> and how do we make sure that we're using some of the, the standards, the BSI, um, ISO standards, and some of the standards that the heating, ventilation and air conditioning industry use today to understand exactly what is going on with the house, but also to come up with strategies to, to improve it. And one of the things that we made sure that we um, was really important was that we engaged with tenants as well. I'll come to the, some of the technology in a minute, but this, what you're seeing here is a 3D model of, um, yeah, 3D machine learning model of a back-to-back -back house. So we can see the basement, first floor, the second floor, and the, and the attic. And this particular one just looks at temperature and how it it's, um, uh, dissipates around the house. And you can see where the hot zones are and um, where, the, where the boiler is. <clears throat> and you can see at the back of the, in the basement, it's, it's quite, quite cold. And we've got the, um, the humidity ones of uh, 3D, 3D models of, those, of that house as well. And when you combine those, you can start to see how the, the air quality in the, in the property, because of maybe mold starting to grow, can start to get worse. But the, the, but the other models that we um, use as well are, let's get to here. Um, some of you may be familiar with um, psychometric charts. Now, I'm not gonna explain exactly what they are, but it's, it's um, what the heating, ventilation, air conditioning uh, industry used to understand how um, the, the the amount of moisture, amount of heat in a in a property or in the rooms, <clears throat> what what that looks like, how that um, how that uh, if you like grows, but then looking at what are the strategies to uh, to reduce it, what the moisture um, control and ventilation methods you can use to reduce it. And it's important that we did this because a lot of the time you all we all have the habit of, well, let's just open a window. <clears throat> but sometimes opening a window can make things worse because if the, if the, if the temperature gets too low and, and there is a dew point or um, uh, uh, some, maybe some of the wall is, is quite cold, then any other condensation that may be in the house may actually settle on that place and, 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 uh, and mould may um, start to grow. So under, under the under the hood of all the things that we're, uh, we've been doing um, is this technology, but we couldn't just show this to tenants and say, follow this chart and it'll be fine. So you have to think of a different way. And that, um, and that way was made even more complex because COVID-19 hit. And um, we started this project right at the very beginning of, of lockdowns. And, and so we had the added pressure of, well, how are you going to get these sensors into people's homes? How are you going to get it so that people will self-install it and it's going to be by consent rather than um, um, by legitimate interest? You know, how are you going to get people on your side? And how are you going to do it 
um, using a, an affordable scale. And make sure that you can actually get anybody from any age, whether they have English as their first, second, third language, um, whatever their situation is, to actually want to get involved and, and um, putting into their homes. That was a big um, hurdle we had to overcome. So in the first few, few months, it was about how do we engage with customers, understanding what it is about the Internet of Things, what is it about the quality of their homes, what is it about their perception of air quality and their perception of being able to afford or, or, or their, um, their perceived difficulty in changing their habits. And we used to do all that research first before saying, okay, well, here's some technology you're gonna put in your home. You're gonna help us to understand a little bit more about your homes so that we can come up with strategies that can then help you to then improve them. And not only um, themselves, but working with um, the Green Doctor <clears throat> and with Leeds as well, come up with, with multiple pathways to, to applying that help because everyone's different and everyone's got a different set of um, skills or, or income to actually um, to affect that change. It's a bit of a, a sales thing, but what we also had to do was try and find a way of um, communicating information to people in such a way that it wasn't always graphs. So on the, the left-hand side, um, uh, there's the, um, if you like, the, all the properties based on risk. <clears throat> so that whether that be temperature risk, or humidity risk. And then on the right-hand side, we've got how we've taken all that um, uh, machine learning, all that analysis, and just present a video to somebody. And how do you take all of that to present a video to somebody to say, look, maybe try doing this and do it in different languages as well. <clears throat> now, so, so I'll end with, with this. Um, what we've, and I'm kind of summarising, I suppose, everything that we've been doing for the last 12 months. It is about people. People. <clears throat> we started off with this idea that it's obvious, you know, if you're going to do ventilation, if you're going to do heating, improve it and, and retrofits, it's just obvious that you do these things. Um, but sometimes data isn't obvious. Um, and we had to find a way of how do you take all that data, squeeze it down into a, into a one minute clip, somebody uh, specific to their property and their circumstances that they could understand that they could affect a change but not only to affect the change but see that the change was um had an improvement to their lives whether it be reducing the costs or making them feel better and one, one example of that we had one lady who um was, she had a dehumidifier and is one of the um powered ones rather than chemical ones and she's wiping down her windows every single day. Um, she had the dehumidifier on. Um, her daughter had asthma as well. Um, and she just couldn't understand what was going on, that she was always having to um, wipe down the windows and the contents and the, the humidity levels are so high. And what she then discovered by looking at all the data that we provided to her in a very simple format, she could see that, yeah, actually, um, the bathroom and the moisture coming from the bathroom was causing a problem in other rooms and she needs to close the door. Um, and that was a very simple thing. And I think it's one mission for us is to how do you make data as simple as possible for people to make those actions that are affordable and achievable for themselves. But if they can't do it themselves, get the, get the right help as well. So that, that, that's me. Um, hopefully that's been useful. I'll hand over now to Chun Li. If I know how to stop the. Uh, oh, there we go. Stop sharing. Hi, I'm Chun Li. I will show my screen. Hello, I'm a Chun Li Chow. I'm a the MD and uh, founder of Healthy Air Technology. And uh, today's topic is, uh, is about fixed ventilation or portable ventilation. Let me see. 
first of all, you know, uh, as everybody expected and all know, especially in this COVID situation, lower air quality has very bad impact to people's health. And the, the awareness uh, I felt during last two years became more clearer to everybody and uh, purely uh, because of COVID and also uh, uh, and also the mediums about air quality related to the same. So actually air, air quality is related to worse outcomes for the uh, COVID if they're infected. Actually COVID infection, a rate, uh, infection rate is higher at uh, locations and cities with worse uh, uh, air pollution. This is a study uh, done by Harvard University at uh, August 2020, so almost uh, one and a half years ago. So uh, fresh air is definitely needed as what uh, uh, Alan uh, explained in, uh, uh, at the first uh, presentation for the past 20, 30, 35. So it's, uh, you know, uh, because that uh, uh, fresh air from outside will provide oxygen. And uh, of course, oxygen, if oxygen level is low and people wouldn't be breathed correctly. So, but uh, for air pollution, especially for COVID, that is airborne virus and with the uh, ventilation system, it may uh, distribute in the round, or actually it cannot uh, uh, reduce it, or you know, it can dilute it, but cannot reduce it, and certainly cannot remove the air pollution which generated indoors. There's a many uh, indoor, air so uh, indoor air pollution sources in, uh, in domestic, in buildings, in a apartment, etc. So when people are cooking or even breath, there's a, some air pollution that generated in the air. So for us, you know, uh, our air purifier actually can, this is a standalone air uh, technology and is more than a normal air purifier it can reduce uh, breakdown uh, pollutants, which generated uh, uh, indoors and also uh, generated bringing by outdoor fresh air. And uh, so, uh, and the most important for us is our core technology, which uh, uh, invented in Oxford University can break down pollutants rather than, you know, hide it or, you know, just store it. And there's a no uh, secondary, harmful secondary lease. And also we optimized our design to deliver the clean air everywhere around the room. And there's a no dead spot uh, in, in the room. And, there's a, and also the clean air can be delivered and uh, uh, without any, uh, you know, uh, uh, won't be affected by furniture and, uh, and people's activity. So, and also, you know, with all the uh, good design with smart control technology, no noise, no energy uh, uh, consumption. So how does that work? Actually, we got two in lights and uh, in that way, because uh, it will improve the, improve the efficiency of filters. And we got several uh, filter, um, uh, several layers of filtration. So then when the air coming out of the, of the air purifier, it will has very clean and air. And uh, then we have done, um, you know, to, to, to go with it, we have eight patents granted and also two on the way. So this is a, this is a chemistry uh, chart how it works, our core technology is called the um, the orbital nano oxide technology. And that means, you know, it will, it is a normal temperature uh, uh, catalyst. That's a series of it, which uh, take care of different pollutants in the air and kill bacteria and the viruses. So 
uh, we 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 said uh, you know we said earlier we actually designed the air purifier with the technology it's, it's called the computational fluid dynamics that's the technology you use to design uh, F1 Formula One uh, Formula One cars and uh, so the 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 you know the technology in uh, with that can optimize our air purifier to the maximum level. So this is a, a you know, computational fluid dynamics simulation when people cough. So that means when they cough, if a people who is infected with COVID, it's very likely they will generate a lot of droplets. And that droplets will have a virus uh, attached to it. That's how you know how the how the virus infect people, and uh, so this is a, a video we did um, with uh, with our air purifier turned on, and uh, without our you know the air purifier turned on. So I will show this. Basically, the air purifier will generate a mushroom airflow in the room, and uh, and I will let you watch it. You judge yourself. So, you know, there's a, uh, there's a person in here at the corner of the room, and this room is seven, uh, multiply seven. So when he calls, there's a, you know, this is a lot of droplets coming out of him. And uh, so the left hand side with the air purifier turned, on, uh, turned off, and uh, this one is turned on. So actually it's a red condensation, you know, concentration of the droplets which carries a virus will, will infect people. So at the very beginning of an uh, uh, epidemic, people don't understand why some people close to the guy wasn't infected. And some people, you know, uh, further to him is, uh, is infected. So uh, actually this simulation is uh, a good uh, demonstration why it has happened. So maybe at the, you know, closer to him, the, the, the concentration of the droplets is low, but it's a, you know, maybe four, four meters away or five minutes away. And even the guy somewhere, somewhere in here didn't even talk to the guy or never met you know, to the guy was infected just because of the, the traveling pattern of the droplets. And with our air purifier, it can dissipate the droplets very quickly and to a safe level and then reduce it, you know, um, break down it and, uh, uh, you know, gradually. Let me finish all of this. Okay, so for a simple recap, you know, past 2035 gives a, give, gives a very good guidance on fresh air needed for oxygen purpose. And but uh, with outside, you know, this air, fresh air, which is uh, coming with uh, outside air pollution, and uh, that uh, will be also introduced into the room. Apart from the outside uh, air pollution, there's uh, so many sources indoors. For example, you are cooking, and people, you know, who is infected with virus will will breath out with different uh, viral load uh, droplets. And maybe you use corporate copy air that will generate ozone and all the other other uh, pollutants. So, uh, so it is uh, actually a, a, a industry trend. It uh, you know standalone air purifier should be used in a larger scale because that is a, a cheaper way to do it. Basically, you buy the you buy the machine. Put plug in and play, and then you don't need to meddle with the existing uh, infrastructure of the house. And also, it's portable, you can put everywhere in the room. And so, from what we studied, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the size of our air purifier can provide uh, clean air the, uh, you know, uh, for the whole house, which is around uh, two, le two, uh, two, level, two levels. And around 80 meters squared using living living space.
So that's, uh, uh, that's basically uh, from me today. I will hand over to, uh, to Joe. Thanks, Chun-Li. Um, okay. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Joe Hughes. I'm the Chief Exec of Manx Technology Group, and I'll be talking about uh, indoor air quality with IoT technology. So my screen should now be shared. So to start off, it's probably worth giving you a very brief introduction to what IoT is. Um, there's lots of definitions. From, from a sort of distilled point of view, I like to categorize into sensors, the network and the software. And um, sensors can be a range of things, gases, temperature, humidity, and um, particulates, as Chun Lee's been talking about. The network, the task of that is really to take those measurements and transmit it back to a data store or the cloud. And then the final piece is the software, which is really where the value of any solution is, where you can visualize do reports or generate alerts or alarms if there's an issue with the, the data. So when we talk about sensors, you know, the topic today is indoor air quality. So I've highlighted um, the sensors that are relevant. Generally, CO2, temperature, humidity, VOCs, and maybe particulates, and in some cases, NOx gases. But as you can see on the slide, there's a whole range of sensor technologies that we work with across the range of verticals. Um, and pretty much you can get sensors for everything nowadays, you know, from mouse traps to collar forms to uh, CO2 irrigation control. So this really just highlights the, the key sensors. Many of these uh, Leonard talked about, um, and he'll be using similar technology um, in his platform um, with a, a visualization of some products and a dashboard. So the network really is one area I'm going to focus on today because I think it's it serves as a foundation for a lot of these solutions. And generally, IoT uses a technology called LP WAN, which is low power WAN. And where that's different to say Wi-Fi, and you can see on this slide, is it has a low data rate because it's only required to transmit small amounts of data, but it has a high range. Uh, so unlike Wi-Fi, it can maybe travel 15 kilometers. Um, and it's also very low power. So it lends itself to sensors because it'll run on watch batteries, AA batteries. And many of our sensors that we use might have a five to 10 year battery life in the field. So there's a low maintenance overhead as well. And this kind of shows where it's positioned. And the network has really been a game changer for IoT because it enables a whole range of applications uh, in urban and in rural settings. So this slide really illustrates the sort of range that you can achieve with uh, what we call LoRaWAN, which is one of the most common IoT wireless technologies. And in a sort of urban or what we call an extra urban environment like a city, typically two kilometers, three kilometers from a gateway um, is what you'd expect. And the cost of a gateway can range from 300 pounds to a thousand pounds. So they're quite inexpensive. Where in a rural setting, you know, I'm based in the Isle of Man and we have offices in Scotland in the Highlands, you know, 15 kilometers from a sensor is easily achievable. So you can imagine in a domestic setting of social housing, um, rural housing, farms, it's, it's perfectly well suited to collect key data and report back. So a, a case that I want to talk about today is um, in the Isle of Man where we're based. Uh, there's a, a range of digital sectors in the island, uh, in the economy and some of them quite cut and edging. The government here in the digital agency um, recognised that once you have the foundations in place, a large scale network that facilitates all types of technologies and innovation, one of which is indoor air quality, which we monitor in the schools on the island uh, with the COVID outbreak um, and also entrepreneurs and businesses, manufacturing, social housing. There's a whole range of things. And really the goal in the Isle of Man was to create a network that would deliver economic and societal benefits. So it's not just all about money, it's improving outcomes, it could be reducing cost or in some cases improving profits. And a key stipulation of that network was it's free to access. Councils, uh, startups, charities, local authorities can all use that network for free. What that means is over a large area, um, you can deploy all of the sensors that have been talked about, indoor air quality sensors, outdoor air quality sensors, water quality, and um, door sensors, window sensors, over a large scale, and they all transmit their data back to the cloud uh, using batteries 
And from there, you can visualize that data. So this slide really shows um, a model that we use to, to model network coverage. Uh, this is uh, Douglas in the Isle of Man. And once you have that, it supports a range of applications, which are at the top right of the slide, which can then be used by a whole variety of industries or public sector bodies um, or organizations. So just to il illustrate the scale, this is the Isle of Man here to the east is like Whitehaven, Belfast to the west. So it's about 52 kilometers long and it, at its longest point, 22 wide. Um, and that the island's probably around 90, 95% covered now with a network, which in the grand scheme is relatively inexpensive. Uh, and then the whole island and the majority of the population, businesses and startups can all use that network to innovate and importantly measure indoor air quality uh, in a domestic setting. What it also has enabled, and it's been talked about, about opening windows, is we use the network to do uh, tech trials. Tech trials are quite popular on the island. Um, and we measure outdoor air quality uh, using vans. Uh, so when our vans are uh, driving around the island and doing normal business, they're measuring uh, NOx gases, particulates, uh, carbon monoxide, transmitting the data back in real time. And then that can be viewed as a heat map uh, over a large scale. Uh, we're also talking to organisations in London to do it there and also in the northwest of England. Um, and what that really does, and what we find is quite interesting, is when you look at the indoor particulate count, the indoor CO2 levels or NOx levels and VOCs, and compare that to the outdoor measurements, and you can then in effect assess the uh, efficacy or the effectiveness of filtration or air handling devices. And also you can then correlate that with things like weather patterns, and if there's like a low pressure, high pressure, wind direction, and that becomes a machine learning and a data exercise. Uh, this slide just illustrates uh, an inexpensive air quality device. We are actually working with a digital agency to deploy these around schools, uh, in local authority settings, and all of that data is publicly available. So business owners and local authorities can make informed decisions by using that data and the public, of course. Um, and something we like to promote is something called the digital mirror, where what we find in the course of business is a lot of business leaders or politicians um, are slightly anxious about measuring pollution or air quality, because if it suggests there's a problem, they have to deal with it, where if you don't measure it, arguably there's not a problem because there's no data. So we use the term digital mirror, which is you in effect reflect the data back on the people whose behaviour is causing that data. So in the case of schools, parents driving to school, it could be uh, businesses trying to encourage their staff to cycle or use active travel. And by showing them the data, they can see themselves where the issue is, and hopefully that will influence behaviours. Um, the software, you know, uh, Leonard talked about machine learning, AI. We use a range of different software depending on the, on the market and the vertical, but generally the key is to take all of that data, present it in a way that you can uh, see insights uh, act on that data and then change behaviours, or in the case of business, it could be reduced cost or in healthcare and uh, improve outcomes. Uh, and the network is the key to that. And that's me. So I'll hand back. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, this is uh, Peter Bates here. I'm going to um, uh, collate any questions which we have so please do put any questions you have in the chat remembering to use the word question in capitals before it which will make it easier for me to um, understand uh, before i start with the questions um i'm going to uh, pass you over to um Orian, who's going to explain about the breakout rooms and other opportunities to have one-to-one -one meetings after this event as well <laughs> Hi everyone. Well, first of all, thank you for the speakers. Uh, that was very interesting and thank you for all the attendees uh, for staying with us until now. So um, these are the breakout rooms. There's three of them with all the speakers. Uh, you, Most of you have already picked which um, breakout room you were interested in joining, so that's been automatically done. So once we open the breakout room after the Q&A, you will be automatically assigned. If you haven't, or if you change your mind, that's fine. You will be able to change and move around in the different rooms. If you have any problem, don't worry. You can let me know or Peter or any member of the Cambridge Clean Tech team, and we will help you uh, assign you to the appropriate room. Regarding after the event, so there's a Google Doc uh, link. 
um, and you can just tick which speaker you're interested in being introduced to. You don't have to fill that now. We'll I'll send you the link after the event, and you can pick which which speakers you want to meet after the event as a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, Peter, back to you. Okay, right. Uh, well, I, I've already got a few questions coming in. Uh, there's more coming in on the chat as well. But let me start off with the uh, some a, a number of questions uh, which which I have and. Uh, uh, the, the, we have uh, one person in particular who has lots of questions to ask Joe. Um, but uh, starting off with Alan, when um, can we get, we got all the speakers showing there? Uh, that's great. Okay, Alan, um, could you ask um, when should past 2035 be used? For example, I'm about to change my windows. Should I be following past 2035 or should I get my windows installer to uh, look into past 35? Well, I think you you personally would be, uh, I'm sure, would follow it as a retrofit coordinator yourself. Um, and um, yes, if we haven't convinced you of the benefits, uh, we, we, um, we're on a no-win no, no scenario. But, um, but yeah, there's... Um, I think what you're what you're looking for me to say is that PAS 2035 uh, is required for projects that are going to receive government funding. So that's moving forward from now. Um, it's otherwise it's optional. I would certainly recommend it, and I um, hope you might as well. Um, but it wouldn't be a um, it's not a requirement uh, except in association with government funding. Yes, that, uh, that was the answer I was looking for, Alan. That's a lot of good uh, in that respect. Good. <laughs> uh, another question is, um, uh, well, I'll come, no, I'll come on to that one. Uh, uh, Leonard, uh, how do tenants react to the data being collected in their own homes? Yes, this is um, it always comes up around GDPR and privacy. Um, can you explain maybe, the acronym to, to Yeah, sorry. Um, Oh, you can ask me to <laughs> general data protection regulation. Have I got that right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Really? Um, so, um, so yeah. So there's this um, one thing that we always, yeah, you know, we started with is this idea of um, data privacy and data agency. And um, we were just talking about it before this meeting, but the the sensors and the the hub device they collect data and store it on the hub and don't send everything to the cloud and that's a very deliberate architectural um, decision that we made because we wanted to preserve people's privacy and, and speak to people about that because once they understood that then they're more inclined to say yeah that's fine I'll have the sensors in my house but also we made sure that um, we we're absolutely transparent it was only picking up temperature and humidity and we weren't picking up noise or for ASBO reasons or anything like that, um, and social behavior reasons. And so it, it became quite um, straightforward, really. Um, once, we, once we explain that, once we're doing, we explain that, you know, all your data stays on the edge device, um, people just loved it. Um, now, part of that process was also, how could we surface information for them that was personalized? Again, they, they loved that whole, idea of yes it's my data yes I'm sharing a little bit just to make sure that there's some triggers or some insights that I, I can get some help from from the council but also there's some insights for me personally that can help me um, make sure I'm doing the right thing. Okay and um, another question for you uh, Leonard uh, what are the advantages of collecting data compared to the traditional method of an assessor going into a property? <laughs> It's time, it's time, you know, um, time. Um, we, we've got, um, as part of the project, we've actually had the Green Doctor and um, Cornerstone going into a couple of the properties and doing an evaluation of our data against um, what they see. And, you know, it can take three hours and it's just a one shot um, inspection. Um, whereas what we're doing is that continual, um, if you like, inspection. And, and it's it's as accurate um, because we, we set it up against the there's a, um, a protometer. It's like a moisture meter. <clears throat> so the sensors that we use are using Sensorian um, um, sensors in there. So they're highly accurate, highly sensitive. And we've discovered that actually 
um, very low cost approach was better than, if you like, the one time hit. Now, there's some things that we simply can't do with the technology. Something you, know, you can't go and crawl into into lofts and see whether the insulation is is, is laid correctly. We can at least give the indicators of actually there's a cold spot in that corner of the loft that is then going to be um, causing a problem. And we're doing it at a lot lower cost and a lot faster as well. Okay, thanks, um, uh, Leonard. A uh, question for both uh, Alan and also Chun Li. Um, I, I think I probably kind of warned you that I'd be asking this type of question anyway. Um, question uh, is, wh when should fixed mechanical ventilation be used and when is it appropriate to use uh, a portable solution? Chun Li, if you wouldn't start first. So yeah. when... When should fixed mechanical ventilation be used and when is it appropriate to be used uh, to use a portable solution? Um, uh, actually, in uh, generally speaking, in, uh, in your case, uh, building stock, <laughs> the, 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 the building are very leaky. So actually, you don't need a fixed uh, mechanical ventilation to that because the uh, you know the fresh air coming in through your the envelope of the of the building, and uh, so to handle your air pollution problem, standalone uh, machine can be used straight away and to clear clear out uh, the pollutants from outside, and which is basically through all the cracks and leakages from the building, and also uh, generated indoors. So that, that is for the existing, uh, uh, you know, building stock, and for the the one, uh, you know, just refurbished, uh, which uh, you know it's uh, it's uh, regulated by Pass Twenty Thirty Five, because you insulated the building really well, so the leakage is small, and uh, you know if you don't use mechanical ventilation. The, the oxygen level is low. So it is uh, so controlled, controlled better for the leakage, but you need mechanical ventilation to provide uh, uh, fresh air and oxygen to the indoors. But in the meantime, you also need to have a standalone air purifier, which can clear out and uh, you know, basically uh, clear out the, clean the air for you while you are doing your you know, activities, for example, cooking, etc. Thank you, Chun Li. Uh, Alan, any, any further comments? Well, I think Chun Li's uh, summed it up quite well there, really. I mean, we've, she's absolutely right that most homes do rely largely on infiltration for fresh air still, which is one of the points I made, I think, in, in my presentation. Uh, but that has to change, of course, um, over the next few years. Uh, we need to uh, retrofit um, 20 million plus homes. And, and as part of that, we need to provide adequate mechanical ventilation. Uh, so that's, that's, a, that's a changing situation. I, I think, um, um, yeah, it, it, uh, again, as, as Chun Li has said, it, it, it's if you've got poor air quality coming in, from outside, which you haven't got in all locations, but in some locations you have, then you are going to want to uh, um, uh, filter that air in some way. And unless you've got, if you've got mechanical supply, then you can incorporate filtration into that supply. But if you've got extract only systems, then then you can't. Thanks, Alan. Yes. Okay. So you, I think uh, hopefully you've seen everybody has, has kind of seen the, the kind of general theme we've been looking at. Uh, a, a standard or, or methodology as in terms of past 2035 we, we're then moving on to the ability to use uh, technology like the internet of things uh, and more sophisticated technologies in order to uh, capture uh, the different uh, pollutants that are in people's homes and then uh, Joe was speaking about the uh, uh, the ability to be able to use uh, LORA, I can never pronounce this correctly, but LORA WAM, which is a, 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 a variation, but different from Wi-Fi. Um, and actually, Joe, you've got uh, three questions. You have a, you have a fan uh, in the form of uh, Natalie, who's asked three questions here. Uh, I'm not sure whether she's one of your colleagues or not, but uh, let me just read out the questions anyway uh, from Natalie. Uh, can you use uh, can you use some 
kind of energy harvesting to par uh, low low am low lower am low lower am I get it right in a moment so uh, instead of batteries and the answer is yes so just to illustrate uh, I touched on low power WANs before if you use like 4G in a sensor that power draw is about 400 milliamps as a rule of form where if you use a, a LoRaWAN chipset, it's around 40 milliamps. So obviously it's a 10 times reduction in the power. Um, but beyond that as well, when you transmit data using 4G, there's obviously a setup time for it to join the network, uh, access the APN, take the data, send the data, and that may be 30 seconds to a minute. Where uh, the LoRaWAN networks, the, the network setup time, the transmit time is very efficient. So the device switches on, takes the measurement, sends the data, shuts back down again and goes into deep sleep mode. So that's why you can run sensors on battery for long amounts of time. And when it comes to energy harvesting, which is obviously harvesting energy from radio and RF, and yet there are manufacturers who use that technology. It really depends on the sensor because some sensors like CO2 use infrared technology, dissolved oxygen uses um, galvanic sensors or infrared, and they have a higher power draw. So generally when you're calculating power budgets, it's the frequency of measurement. Is it every minute? Is it once an hour? Is it once a day? And um, how big the payload is determines how long you have to transmit that data for. But the quick answer is yes, you can use energy harvesting, but there's a number of caveats associated with that. And uh, Natalie was also asking, can uh, LORAM be used for uh, home automation? Um, it can. Uh, what I would say generally from my experience is when you have things like Alexa, Hive, Google Home, all these different technologies, they're very much consumer focused and they use Wi-Fi. People are familiar with it. And um, there are LoRaWAN home automation, but it's less common, I'd say, in the consumer setting, more common in the B2B setting. Um, but it can absolutely be used and hobbyists use it. But generally, when you look at Amazon or the sort of marketplace, it's not as common as Wi-Fi home automation, which is or Philips Hue or accessible devices like that. Okay, I'm just going to ask two questions that have just come in and then uh, we'll uh, finish to go to the breakout rooms. Um, so uh, one question is uh, maybe for Alan, uh, let me read it out anyway. Past 2034, sorry, past 2035 and air quality, uh, is the clean tech option preferable uh, to mechanical um, MH? Um, VR uh, for social housing and government funding lad and warm homes. That makes sense, Alan. Um, I think I think so, and the answer's um, no. You need the you need the fresh air anyway. Um, so the um, the clean tech uh, system is 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 cleaning the air. Uh, but it's not bringing in fresh air. It's not extracting moisture either, I don't think. Shunley can correct me if I'm wrong there, but that's the other main reason why, or a major reason why we need um, air movement in, uh, out of the dwelling. So we need air movement out of the dwelling to, to remove moisture and, and other pollutants. And we need air it coming in um, uh, to provide fresh air. So, so it's, not an, it's not an alternative, as I understand it. Um, but uh, because because uh, um, the standalone um, uh, devices, uh, clean clean air devices, can also remove uh, the potential, uh, uh, you know, potential the you know the the seed of the mold. So that's why I give a chance. Uh, so it's give less chance for the mold to be survived. So that is also, uh, and actually that seed is actually is, uh, really can damage people's house really heavily. It will can grow because when people inhale it, it will actually can grow in the lung and cause yeah. some damage. So that is, a, a, you know, I would say, you know, for our um, for home uh, environment, and also for our indoor environment, there's so many chemicals will be generated indoors, and um, and uh, uh, you know clean air is clean air devices are really highly recommended because there's so many um, study has been has been carried out around the world 
and uh, by you know, all famous universities, many, many universities. It is a, this is a conclusion, basically. It's not uh, something uh, concluded uh, many times ago already. Pollution it can cause a lot of, uh, uh, you know, basic learning ability, etc. So it's a uh, basically, you know, the, the, the people's uh, coherence, you see, that's the, so reflecting to the people who is older, that is dementias, and uh, for re re reflecting to people who is younger is learning ability. Thanks, Chin Lee. Um, one last question, uh, and if you can give a quick answer, Leonard. Uh, I know there's another question relating to a wear tag, but if um, uh, that uh, um, uh, person could actually go into the chat with Leonard, go into the breakout room with Leonard, that would be great. But let, one last question, it says, uh, it seems to me, uh, this is from Thomas, it seems to me um, the key for a way tag uh, is, the solution, is the, the solution is scalable, easy to deploy and monitors uh, stroke alerts without having people visit. Is my understanding correct? Yes. <laughs> okay, thanks for your time. Okay. <laughs> that was very short, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot again, everybody, the speakers, um, uh, for, for speaking. Uh, Warren, do you want to say anything before we move into the breakout rooms? Um, probably no. Yeah, sorry, yeah bear with me. Um, yeah, no, I think it'd be interesting to see what everyone has to say and to... Um, see what can be done to improve the environment inside the home. Okay, thank, thanks a lot everybody for attending uh, as well. I think we've got round about kind of uh, at one stage we had nearly 60 uh, uh, participants uh, in the event. So now the next stage uh, is for you to choose your breakout rooms and which I think uh, Orian, people have already informed you about that. So you'll now be put into your great breakout rooms and we aim to finish a prop about no later than 5.30. So it'll take a few minutes for Orianne to um, move you into a breakout room and anybody that's not been allocated a breakout room or, or um, has asked for a breakout room if you can uh, just put uh, a message in the chat or, or one directly to Orianne and we'll get you into the rooms. Uh, we've still got about 15 participants at the present moment. Hopefully all the speakers have now moved into the, their yeah. own breakout rooms. Still about 14 people. You should be able to change your room at the bottom of your screen. There's a bit breakout room section, and then you can pick the room. Um, should it? <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so these are the rooms. Uh, you should be able to see them now. We'll stop recording.